In the last lecture, we focused on choosing among alternatives uh, where there is no uncertainty, but we wanted to value uh, alternatives in terms of their attributes. For example, in terms of selecting a job, the salary, and the vacation, just as uh, just an instance. Now we want to move into cases where we're choosing among alternatives, but the outcomes of choosing those alternatives or the consequences are uncertain. In other words, the attributes of those alternatives will have some random variation. And the question is how to deal with the risk associated or the uncertainty associated with those random variations. This means we're going to move from value theory to utility theory. First of all, let's talk about uncertainty. Okay. Uh, people often are concerned about uncertainty. Actually, in the fourth lecture, we're going to talk about why uncertainty is your friend and why you actually like alternatives that are uncertain, but we're not going to do about that today. First, we're going to do the basics of, of uncertainty and uh, talk about how to change the way we look at our functions uh, for uh, representing our risk avoidance, aversion, or, or our risk uh, attitude, if you will. So let's talk about some frequently asked questions. Uh, during my sojourn away from academia for 13 years, I dealt with a, uh, a large number of executives and uh, thousands, in fact, and uh, it was interesting to see what kind of questions they had. What, what, what came up often? Um, so we'd work on a strategy for a new product or a business strategy or a uh, market penetration strategy and come up with some alternative using our analytic tools that we had. And uh, a chief executive or a senior executive would say to me, how wrong can I be and still have this decision make sense. Obviously, they got some uncertainty about the formulation of the problem, uh, but they'd like to make a decision that has some robustness relative to this uncertainty. What are they, un what are they uncertain about? Well, they're uncertain about stakeholders and their intentions. Stakeholders include customers, suppliers, employees. You know, our, how, we've made assumptions about what people want, for example, in the marketplace. What if we're wrong? <clears throat> what if we're wrong? Is the decision just outright wrong, or is it just not as good? They're uncertain about the attributes and their relative importance. They've assumed, in, in one case, for example, we, uh, we used our tools to do the early design of the Mini Cooper. And we represented how different stakeholders felt about that potential car. What if we were wrong? What if we missed attributes, or we, we had some things more important than they should have been, or vice versa? Uh, they're also uh, uncertain about what are the alternatives. For example, one alternative that is often uh, very important is the status quo. In other words, the customer can choose to buy your car or somebody else's car or not buy a car at all. And the status quo is often compelling for several reasons. One is you already know how to do it. It doesn't cost anything. And you're successful immediately. Okay, so the status quo is an alternative that uh, we need to consider. Another kind of question they come up with is how bad can things get and still have this decision make sense? In other words, we might be right about the situation now, but uh, the situation will change. So a lot of our work in the automobile industry, for example, they plan a new car, they, they, they project what the customer wants, but the car takes several years to come out. Things may have changed. A competing car may have come out that gives them things we never thought of. The economy may go south. So the Edsel was planned in 1954 or whatever, 53, but came out in 57 when there was a major recession in the United States and people weren't buying upscale cars. So despite what you think of the, uh, the Edsel's awkward look, uh, it was positioned for a market that no longer existed at that time. What are they uncertain about? The consequences and their implications. For example, they're uncertain about the consequences of taking that choice. Okay, if we go back to our no notion of choosing jobs, you may be certain about salary and vacation, but you may not be certain at all about what it's going to feel like to work there. Uh, they're uncertain about how stakeholders will react to the consequences. In other words, how will other people, customers, suppliers, employees, react to what plays out? Uh, and given that we're uncertain about what plays out, 
we're going to be very uncertain about how stakeholders might react. Uh, and also we're uncertain about our ability to influence the consequences. Things can happen that we just can't have any control over. And so decision, the executives are saying, if these kind of things go wrong, uh, does this decision still make sense? So what they're looking for is a decision that's robust relative to the alternative futures that might, might emerge. So we're going to approach this looking at decision trees. This is a classic uh, approach to representing how people deal with uncertainty. In this decision tree, the box represents a point at which you get to decide. Do you want to go one way or another? Uh, nature decides when there's a circle. Uh, we spin the roulette wheel, we shake the dice, uh, or whatever way that uh, is done, and we get an outcome. So, for example, we take a chance, uh, and then nature decides whether we win or lose. So we take a chance and buy the lottery ticket. Uh, or we can play it safe. We don't lose anything, but we don't win anything either. So, first of all, I want to mention, for this lecture and for the next set of lectures, we're going to need some basic probability theory, okay? Uh, about conditional probability, the notion of probability independence, uh, Bayes' theorem, and expected value, okay? Uh, this is my basic primer on probability. If these things are very foreign to you, uh, much of what I say, or at least significant a portion of what I'm going to say in the next few lectures, are going to be uh, maybe a little difficult to understand. Uh, you may want to go back and look at your probability notes from, from an earlier year. So let's look at our uh, lottery example. We can buy a ticket, and with some probability P, we win 1,000. 1 minus P, we lose. We end up at 0. Or we can keep the money. It's safe. We end up at 10. The expected value of buying is P times uh, 1,000. It should be 1,000, not 10,000 plus 1 minus p times 0, and the expected dollars is, uh, of, of playing it safe is $10. So obviously, uh, your attitude to this might depend on what's p. Now, one way we could do, deal with this uncertainty is we could buy some information. We could buy some information that helps us. So before we buy stocks, we might look at some valuation of companies. Before we uh, buy a house, we might look at comparables for houses in the neighborhood. Okay, so we can try to reduce our uncertainty. So information reduces or eliminates uncertainty and helps you to avoid losing courses of action. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to modify our decision tree to reflect the purchase of the information and subsequent modification of your courses of action. So the value of information equals the expected value of the path with the information purchase minus the expected value of the best alternative path. So let's look at that. So now we have a situation we can buy a ticket and with P we win the thousand dollars. We could buy a tip and the tip tells you whether your number is going to win or not or you keep the money. So you walk up to the cash register at the 7-Eleven you're going to buy a ticket for the lottery and the person behind the uh, counter says you want to buy a tip? I can tell you whether or not the ticket you're about to buy is going to win or not. How much would you be willing to pay for the tip? Well, you certainly wouldn't pay as much as just buying the ticket. But, but you might pay a significant fraction of that to know. Let's see how we would analyze that. So we, if we buy a lottery ticket, again, the 10,000 crept in here again, we've got our, our probabilities expected value. If we buy the tip, we have the cost of the tip plus the same, right? So we're actually having to pay for the tip here. But if we, don't forget, if we don't, if we don't, if we buy the tip and it says the ticket's not going to win, we don't buy the ticket. Uh, so the value of the information is the cost of the tip minus cost of buy is the cost of the tip plus 1 minus P times 10. And we buy the tip if the cost of the tip is less than 1 minus p times 10. Right? We buy the tip if it is cost less than the, the expected value of losing. If p equals 0.1, uh, then, and we're talking about in this case a $10,000 lottery, 
then the expected value of buying is $100. And the tip, if you buy the tip, it's 109.90. .90. And so therefore, the value of the information is $9.90. So, for example, if the guy behind the cash register says to you, uh, I'll sell you a tip for $9.00 that tells you whether the ticket you're about to buy is a winner or not. That's a good deal and for this lottery, for these parameters. That's a good deal because you buy the tip for $9. Chances are he's going to say it's a losing ticket, so you don't buy the ticket. You saved a dollar. If you buy it and he says you are, it is the winning ticket, of course, then you get a huge amount of money from it. So uh, that's how we think about information for reducing uncertainty. So now <clears throat> let's try a more formal approach to developing our, our, our functions for uh, how we feel about uh, attributes and the uncertainty in those attributes. Utility is a, a numerical measure of the strength of a person's preference for an alternative. It's a real number, usually between 0 and 1. It could be between 0 and 100. That's really arbitrary. But it's usually a number between 0 and 1. It says, how strongly do you feel about your preferences for an alternative? Von Neumann and Morgenstern, uh, John von Neumann and Oscar von Morgenstern, uh, Oscar Morgenstern, excuse me, uh, wrote a book in 1948, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. And they finally brought a rigor to the whole of utility theory. Utility theory actually started off in France and England in the, in the 1700s uh, with Bentham and Bernoulli and, and, and Bayes and others were focused on, on this space. Uh, but von Neumann and Morgenstern brought some rigor to this beyond what they had done. And they posed several axioms. And the question is whether you agree with these axioms and then you'd like to behave in accordance with those axioms. I want to differentiate between whether you do behave in normal everyday life versus whether you want to behave according to these axioms. So, for example, in everyday life, you may not want to uh, use these axioms to decide what pizza topping you want at lunch. But you might want to use these axioms to decide which house to buy, or which company to buy, or which major investment to make. So the first axiom says that you either prefer A to B, you're indifferent between them, or you prefer B to A. Well, it's kind of hard to argue with that, right? I mean, everybody would say that, that that's, uh, that's reasonable. The second axiom says that if uh, you prefer A to B and B to C, then you would prefer A to C. Okay? And this means that your preferences are, tr are uh, transitive. Okay. So let's talk about, maybe you say, no, my preferences aren't transitive. So there it goes. I don't, I, don't, I don't really want to buy into these axioms. Let's look at that. This notion of a money pump comes from Ward Edwards from the University of Michigan from way back. And he said, okay, you prefer B to C. So you'll always pay me some small amount, uh, epsilon, to exchange C for B. Okay. So... Uh, I'm going to give you uh, B, and you give me C, and you give me Epsilon, and I put it in my account, my bank account. Then you say you prefer A to B. So I say, okay, I'll give you A, you give me B, and you give me another Epsilon, but I'll put it in my bank account. Now I've got two Epsilon. Then you say, okay, but I actually prefer C to A. I'm not transitive. Okay, I'll give you C, you give me A. And you give me some small amount, epsilon. I add it to my account. Now I've got three epsilon. But then we're back at the same point again. So we can keep on going through this because of your intransitivity, and I can just end up with all your money. That's one of the reasons you don't want to be intransitive. Not because someone will necessarily do that to you, but because you get similar kinds of consequences in, in real decision situations. Fourth axiom if A is preferred to C and B is preferred to C, then you can eliminate C. Uh, choices, fourth axiom, choices among A, B, and C is based on the differing consequences that the choices produce. If they have some similar consequences, those don't matter. And then finally, the desirability of the outcome does not affect its probability. A utility function reflects preferences, attitude toward risk, and so on. The probabilities stay as they are. Now, if you're like me, you sometimes don't believe that. I remember when I was a child, and I would wish for something at Christmas, and I found the easiest way to guarantee I'd get it would be to wish 
I not get it? Okay. So rather than deal with the risk that I wouldn't get something, I, I, I would hope that I didn't get it. And sure as, sure as anything, uh, it resulted in uh, the probability going up. At least that's what I felt like when I was four or five or six. Now, this one of eliminating irrelevant consequences. Let's look at that. So let's say I have A, B, and C here, and, and uh, pretty clear you'd prefer C to B and B to A. What about the right shoe? Well, you're going to get a right shoe anyway, so maybe it doesn't matter. So the right shoe is irrelevant. Now let's try another one. We have tennis racket, right shoe, pogo stick, and right shoe, left shoe plus right shoe. Well, now the, 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 the common attribute has an impact. On, on our preferences, doesn't it? So that, that's why some people will uh, question Axiom 4 sometimes. Okay. Uh, but nevertheless, they, uh, the basic notion, if you, if you agree with those five axioms, then uh, that dictates you should choose the alternative with the maximum expected utility. So you see our whole notion of expected value is the same as we've talked about a few minutes ago, but now it's expected utility as opposed to expected value, because we're not using the x's. If the u wasn't there, it, we'd have the expected value of x, but we're talking about the expected utility of x here. So that, the point is, if you agree with those five axioms and you'd like to make your decisions that way, then you should choose the alternative with the maximum expected utility. Okay. Now, I can tell you from many studies, and we'll talk about behavioral economics in our fifth lecture, but I can tell you from many of those studies, uh, people do not normally behave in a way consistent with maximum expected utility. What we're concerned with, and in the examples I'm going to talk about, is the situations where decision makers would like to behave that way and know without the assistance of our methodology uh, they won't be uh, behaving in that manner. And that's how they get to talk to us to get some help. So let's look at some interesting ones here. This is a very famous example called the L.A. Paradox. Uh, you, you as, a, as a, right on your notes right now, pick A or B. Would you rather have a million dollars for sure, or would you like to play this lottery where there's a 1% chance you get nothing? Now, once you've written down that, now let's look at the second choice. Would you like to play the lottery where you have a slightly less chance of uh, winning five million than winning one million, or equal probability, uh, comp comparable probabilities of zero? <clears throat> so, were you all here in the class? I'd write down all your answers, and we would talk about them. But I can tell you, typically, there's a sprinkling across these four cells of choices that people make. Let's look at what the utility function might be here. So we're going to say that the utility of zero dollars is zero and the utility of five million dollars is one. So the question is what's the utility of one million dollars based on the choices you made? Uh, first of all, a utility function is unique up to a linear transformation. So that's why I can have it a scale from zero to one. I can have a scale from 0 to 100 or 0 to pi. It doesn't matter. Okay? Uh, that's what, what unique up to linear transformation means. That's also, along with lexicographical or ordering that I mentioned last lecture, uh, you can also use this phrase at cocktail parties to impress people when, when they uh, assert something and you can say, well, is that unique up to a linear transformation? That usually will stop people dead. The problem is you may have to explain what you mean and, and that sort of gets to be a tangent. Anyways, we can pick the zero point in the scale. That's the point here. So we're going to make the utility of zero, zero, and the utility of five million, one. And now the question is, what is the utility of one million? Well, if you actually prefer it A to B, then the expected utility of A must be expected greater than the expected utility of B. That's why you picked it. So we use our expected value functions. The probability of one million times the utility of one million uh, is greater than the probability of 5 times the utility of 5 plus the probability 1, utility 1, probability 0, okay? And we just work out the algebra here and plug in the numbers, and this basically says alpha 
is going to be greater than 10 elevenths. Remember, we said the utility of 1 million is alpha, some unknown. Okay, so it, we, at this point, we know if you prefer A to B, then the utility of $1 million is greater than 10 elevenths. Pretty close to the 5 million. Now let's say you picked C preferred to D. Then the utility of C must be greater than the expected utility of D. We formulate our equation again, fill in the numbers, and we get alpha is less than 10, 10 elevenths. What we find out is the choice combinations A and C and B and D are not compatible. If you picked A and C, uh, you were not rational across those two choices, or B and D. This is called the LA problem. It's a famous problem. A Frenchman uh, formed it. Now, the question is, you may not feel that you were being irrational. And many classes I've taught this to have, have commented on this. And let me summarize some of their comments. Why? Do people make these incompatible decisions? Well, one reason is decision makers have difficulty dealing with extreme probabilities of small differences. When you think of probability of 0.9 versus a probability of 0.89, does that really seem all that much different? Uh, decision makers have difficulty dealing with small differences in utility, such as utility of 5 million, utility of 1 million. Okay. Uh, also, there's a question sometimes decision makers are used to dealing with certain kinds of amounts. So maybe you don't make decisions with 5 million to 1 million every day. And so uh, that's, that's part of the, the bias that creeps in. Uh, maybe you'd be better making decisions between 500 and 1,000, for example. Uh, decision makers' preferences between gambles are different than preferences between gamble and a sure thing. So in one case, you've got the sure thing, and you could just take that million dollars. In the other case, you've got to gamble one way or the other, so maybe, maybe your, your feelings change because now you've got to gamble, where in the first choice you didn't have to gamble. And then another common comment from classes is uh, from choice one, they took the sure thing, they've got the million bucks, and so when you get to choice two, you might as well go for the big bucks, you might as well go for the five million. You've got to gamble anyways, you've got a million in your pocket, why don't you go for the big one on this one? Obviously, so there's some temporal variation, the, 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 the logic changes, which is not irrational at all. Okay, so you can see it's sometimes very difficult to be consistent with the axioms of rationality, the utility axioms, without some kind of support, some methodological support that we're uh, talking about. So how do we assess utility functions? Well, one thing we can do is assess ask you to, f to tell us the value of R such that you're indifferent between A and B. Now, let's say we had this lottery ticket, and I ask you how much you'd pay for it. How much would you pay? You know, what would R be so that you're just indifferent? Uh, typically, people will say it comes out to be something like maybe $100, $200 is what they pay uh, to buy the lottery ticket. Now, what, what if you had the lottery ticket, and I want to buy it from you? Would you sell me this lottery ticket for $100, $200? Typically, people say, no. No, no, I expect a lot more than that. I expect three, dollars $400 if I'm selling you a ticket. I've already got it. So the question of whether you pose a lottery, buying or selling, makes a big difference of the utility curve. Okay. People aren't as risk about a lottery ticket they already own, as, as risk averse about a lottery ticket they already own versus when they're entertaining buying. We could repeat it with different probabilities. That makes a difference. We could repeat it with different amounts. And so the way in which you ask the lottery questions to assess the utility curve have an enormous impact. When we talk about behavioral economics in the fifth lecture, uh, you'll see there's a lot of factors going on here that influence how people respond. Uh, in general, what happens is for buying the ticket, we get about $100, as we said. And for selling, sometimes we get as high as 750 this says people are risk averse to buying tickets, but they're risk prone when selling the ticket. Okay, because the whole question of who's taking the risk. When you're selling the ticket, any risk you took in buying that ticket originally is gone. You, you just did it, right? You know, it is what it is. But now I'm selling it to you. I'm more risk prone because you're taking the risk, not me. Uh, we can also. Uh, fix all the amounts, and vary the probabilities. 
so that you're indifferent between A and B. That's another way to do it. Uh, we can uh, value uh, uh, P here with two lotteries. Now, the benefit of two lotteries is that you are taking a risk either way. And back early when we dealt with the alight problem uh, with A and B and then C and D, uh, the, you can see that having to take a risk, that the only choice is a lottery, makes a difference in terms of your attitude towards risk. So assessment issues, there's buying versus selling, there's gambles versus sure things, there's varying the reward versus veiling the probability, and there's some scale effects. And this was a famous study done at Harvard many years ago uh, reporting on people uh, making judgments about amounts of money that they had, se had seldom experienced. And they basically found that people had a very hard time being consistent. And, and that may play into our LA paradox a bit also. So let's talk about what this general utility function for money should look like or tends to look like. So let's talk about some everyday lotteries that we play every day. These are not necessarily buying lottery tickets for your state lottery. These are things you do, your gambles you take inherently. So most decision makers are willing to pay roughly $100 to avoid a small probability, say 0.01, of a large loss, say $10,000. So we put that into our function, and we basically say the utility cannot be linear. It must accelerate with increasing losses. In other words, people are risk averse about losses. People are willing to pay a sure small amount, a sure loss, to avoid the risk of a very large loss. Okay. So as you'll see, that means the function will taper down, as you'll see in a second. But gambling. Many decision makers are willing to pay roughly 50 cents for an expected return of 20 cents. This is typically what you get with a state lottery, for example and a very, very small return, r probability of a big return. This says utility function must increase. People are risk prone. Buying literary tickets, people are risk prone. Buying insurance, they're risk averse. They want to avoid the chance of a large loss. They're risk prone with gambling because they want to attain the chance of a huge gain, even though it's very, very small probability. A third lottery, this is a thing called the Petersburg Paradox. It's been around for a long time. We're going to flip a coin, uh, and you will get paid 2 to the M, or M is the number of, of coin flips until we hit the first tail. Okay. Uh, this series is such that if we calculate the expected return, it's infinite. It doesn't converge. Okay. It's infinite. Uh, but few decision makers would mortgage their homes to play this. Most people would be willing, uh, certainly willing to play a um, uh, dollar, because if the first number of flip it, M, if M equals one, the first flip is a tail, you get a dollar, two to the zero. Okay. Daniel Bernoulli, back in the 1700s, I'm in France, I mentioned to him earlier, uh, basically argued that this must mean that utility at some point has a diminishing returns. In other words, it decelerates with increasing gain. So let's look at the overall utility function. The typical utility function, we don't like large losses, so we're risk averse. We like to pay small amounts to potentially get a big gain, so we're risk prone. But in the long upscale, we're also risk averse again. Okay. What does that mean by being risk averse here? What it means is that the value of each increment of money decreases at some point. In other words, when you get your first million dollars, that feels a lot better to you than when you get your hundredth million dollars. Or another way of saying it is it takes larger and larger increments of gain for you to get the same satisfaction all along the way. So in general, utility functions for money will tend to look like this. So where does that leave us? Well, now we know how to characterize people's attitude about risk associated with money. But typically, money is traded off against something else. Like you pay money to get something. You get, pay money to get performance, to get fuel economy, uh, to get a variety of things. So we're going to look at how we trade off money versus the other thing we get for the money. 
So we have a multi-attribute problem uh, where both attributes have uncertainty associated with them. And that will be the next lecture. Thank you.